Hi, welcome to The Addiction Show. My name is Shira Goldberg, and I am your host. Today I'm really excited to have someone who's uh, just doing such amazing work in Washington. It's hard to believe, but there are some good people over there. Her name is, Na help me with this, um, Naz Gol Godnoush. She's a doctor. Um, she got her doctorate in sociology last year, so congrats on that. She's doing amazing work with the Sentencing Project. Um, like I said, she um, does research and she conducts and synthesizes research on criminal justice policies. So she'll explain what she does and how that affects all of us. So thank you so much for joining um, me, especially on such short notice. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be with you all. So tell us, just start us out, what is the Sentencing Project? Sure. The Sentencing Project is an organization that's based in Washington, D.C., and we do research uh, about national trends in incarceration across the country. And what we do is uh, to do research and advocacy in support of reform of the criminal justice system. Now, I th adv advocacy is, is very important. I'm actually learning about that myself. So what does that mean for the, for the general person? Um, so for what we're doing is to try to inform the public about both the overall scale of incarceration, why it is that the United States has such a large number of people behind bars, um, under community supervision. Um, also, we work on uh, the issue of racial disparities in punishment, so why it is that so many people of color, specifically African Americans and Latinos, are affected by the justice system relative to whites. Uh, so we do public education, we work closely with local advocacy organizations and state advocacy organizations that are working on um, advancing reforms, so passing legislation, um, working to amend policies in the criminal justice system, and we work also directly with uh, policymakers themselves to help to educate them about these issues um, at the local, fe uh, state, and federal levels. Well, that's good to know that they need um, some education too. So, since the election is coming up, that's why we uh, re I really wanted to push for you to be on the show so we can promote this before everyone goes to the vote, the voting polls. How does this affect the just the average Joe in America who's never been in trouble and just doesn't doesn't um, have anything to do with, with these criminals? Um, that's a good question. So you know we know that not everybody is equally affected directly by the justice system, um, so that poor people in particular are more likely to be picked up, um, and people of color especially are likely to be um, entangled in the system. But the system overall affects all of us for many reasons. So one reason is because of the demands that it makes on uh, public budgets. So instead of having more money for education, for you know uh, universal pre-K programs, for um, all kinds of other things that we would like to have public spending on, uh, a lot of states are finding that they don't have these kinds of resources because so, man, so much of their budget is tied up um, on prison spending and other kinds of criminal justice spending. So that's one way that everybody is affected. Uh, another way is that ultimately the goal here is public safety and what we know is that a lot of the policies that are in place right now don't help to promote public safety. They're not effective and so uh, they're not effective at treating addictions, they're not effective at rehabilitating people, so instead of spending money in a way to increase our safety in, a, in an effective way, uh, we're not doing that. And so that's why it's important also in terms of um, being able to meet the goal of public safety, we need to think more carefully about how we're doing that. And ultimately, almost all people that we send away to prisons, they come back. They come back to their communities. They, they come back to live amongst us as neighbors. They come and work with our work, with, work in our workplaces. They come and uh, are our customers and our businesses and so on. And so, uh, you know, we're intimately all connected together in the end. And so it's important to think about why we're sending so many people behind bars and how they're coming out uh, of prisons.
Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make because people don't realize the extent how this how these policies are are really directly affecting all of us. So uh, the money should. Well, I think it should be definitely utilized in a in a more <clears throat> like preventative uh, measures or or education or um, at least not not um, such harsh sentences. And that's what what you do in Washington, the sentencingproject.org. Um, tell us a little bit about um, how that started. I believe you've been around for 25 years. That's right. So the organization started off by. Um, helping uh, criminal defendants and prosecutors to get information that they needed in the sentencing stage, but we've expanded far beyond that to do uh, more general uh, education and advocacy, as I suggested, as I mentioned earlier. And, you know, so recently I've been working a lot on looking at public opinion surveys, and what I realize is that in some ways some of our work is already done uh, in the sense that the public actually supports, um, is much more supportive of rehabilitation and um, of prevention than policymakers realize. So in some ways what we're trying to do is to help educate policymakers to realize that we're no longer in a tough on crime era. And a lot of policymakers realize this now. Uh, and we have models across the country of places that have scaled back punishment very effectively. Um, and I can talk more about those examples later. So that's, you know, that's a great realization that um, policymakers are actually overestimating how much people support uh, punishment as a solution to these kinds of problems. So for example, recently um, Pew put out a survey in April 2014 and it asked uh, a random you know, pop group of the public what they thought about scaling back mandatory sentences for, for drug offenses. And they found that the majority of Americans now support uh, scaling back and eliminating mandatory drug sentencing. Um, so this is great, but this is something that my, I understand from research and from working directly with policymakers that they don't realize, um, some of them don't realize how much the public has shifted on this issue. So that's one way that we're trying to help um, to bring policies in line with what the public actually wants to see in terms of these issues. Well, wow, so re research really does help. That's great. <laughs> yes. I, I think it's, yeah, for those of you that aren't familiar with Pew, it's Pew Research Center, I believe, P-E-W. They do, they do great things for, for oh, and uh, provide a lot of resources as well, so I'd, I'd check that out for sure. And I, you know, I've noticed um, the the connection. I wouldn't say correlation, but I think that between the amount of people that are getting addicted to drugs and those families and loved ones that are being affected, I think their their position has has taken a a, a different direction because they are being affected. So maybe ten years ago, when their kid was nine or ten years old, they're like, you know, throw these criminals away and, and uh, throw away the key. But now when they're in the position where maybe their kids are getting busted with drugs and they're facing very expensive uh, legal battles and, and really harsh uh, sentences, I think that's <clears throat> making a lot of people reconsider, you know, and, and really take a look at, hey, what is going on here? So I think a lot of people are starting to tap into um, interest in, in wanting more information about that. That's right. Uh, so you mentioned. Oh, I think um, I may. I'm sorry. What? All of us that that's that's going on. Oh, here you are. Did you hear me? Oh, I did. I did hear most of what you said. That's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, because she'll agree with me 100 <laughs> percent. So I, I agree with you, and I want to add a little bit to that, which is to say that. Um, you know, nobody wants drug, drug, substance abuse, drug addiction to go untreated, especially if they're directly affected by it, if they have a loved one who's suffering with these problems. Unfortunately, what a lot of people realize is that punishment is not really the solution. It's not helping people to kick their addictions. What we need is more, more investment in treatment. Um, and, you know, a lot of times people that 
that sell in order to sustain an addiction. That people, so a lot of people are selling to sustain an addiction. A lot of people commit other kinds of crimes to sustain addiction. So we know that about 16% of the prison population is there for a drug offense. But the impact is actually much, the impact of our drug policies is actually much broader than that because a lot of people, as I mentioned, might be there for a property offense or they might have committed a robbery so they're there for a violent offense because of the drug addiction that they're trying to sustain. So by not having effective policies that gets at the addiction, we're just cycling people in and out of the system either under a drug conviction or other kinds of convictions. So a lot of people are realizing this and are looking for other solutions uh, and for public spending that that gets uh, that tries to support treatment efforts and prevention efforts um, and something else that you mentioned you know it's not just the individual with the addiction that's affected it's also their families and in some ways very directly so for example right now in our drug policy people that have a felony drug conviction they have a very hard time re-entering society they can't access um, some forms of public housing, they, they cannot um, access student loans, and very importantly for low-income people, they can't access uh, welfare benefits in many states. Um, so TANF and SNAP, um, these are federal programs that states have the option of prohibiting people from fed uh, felony drug convictions from accessing, and about three-quarters of states block people from accessing these benefits. They don't even need to. They, they, don't, they can still get their federal funds if they opted out of it. So what, we, what we've done is actually we've done a, research, a study to show that uh, with, with respect to this federal welfare ban, it's mostly women of color that are affected and, and then their children are also affected mm -hmm. um, who rely on them for these kinds of resources. So, huh. so that's how the, you know, the extent of these policies that we have to so to you know um, that that block people from re-entering have imp that has impact way beyond the individual that's affected by the drug conviction itself, and it's really counterproductive if you think about it because if someone would continue to use drugs and sell drugs knowing that they might get incarcerated, most people don't even realize that once they're released they're going to face these kinds of restrictions. So it's not as if it's helping people. Um, it's a deterrent uh, because most people are, you know, are really in the thralls of an addiction who get into, uh, who go into the criminal justice system for a drug offense, and so, um, you know, knowing they don't even know about these later, what's called co collateral consequences, and even if they did know, it's not clear that it would it would suddenly snap them out of their addiction. So it's a kind of policy that you know resulted from people and the public un being understandably upset about the problem of drug addiction, but not really thinking carefully about crafting solutions to address that problem. Right. I, th I think um, we've, we've been a nation for decades who, um, who look at the back end instead of the punitive aspects, which uh, result in these long-term ramifications, not just for the person who who's uh, committing burglary to sustain their habit. But once they get out, the, I, I believe the majority of people um, do get better um, and they, they go into recovery. But that legacy is extended um, during their, their addiction. It extends to their children. So why are we penalizing the children for the legacies of you know, a, a, a phase or a period in someone's life? That's right. That's right. And 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 as a and as a consequence of that, we're also limiting the amount of resources that we have for treatment programs. So that if someone wants to enter treatment, often if they don't have the funds to independently pay for it, they have to wait on long waiting lists and so on. And so it's just it's not it's not smart public policy what we're doing and luckily as i mentioned the you know as and as you said as you said the public is increasingly aware of you know the failures of these policies and we're seeing reforms all around the country what we've seen less often is an attempt to undo the damages that we've done to people under the previous you know war on drugs um, system that still continues to a large extent 
but is starting to become modified. So recently, well, a couple years ago, the last drug czar that we had in the country, Gil Krolikowski, he said that he was no longer going to be using the war on drugs language. So he said there's, there's no way for people to not see a war on drugs as a war on people. You know, and so we're not at war with the people of this country. And he wanted to begin a new kind of dialogue about how to deal with uh, drug abuse. Um, most, the most recent uh, and the current drug czar has a public health perspective on, on substance abuse. And so these are really you know, great changes in terms of how uh, the public discourse on these issues. We haven't yet seen a significant scaling back of punishment on these issues. We've seen some minor reforms. So one of the one of the biggest ones was in 2010, the Fair Sentencing Act tried to equalize the sentencing disparity between crack and cocaine. So uh, mm -hmm. until that point, there was you know the hundred there's a hundred to one disparity in terms of the weight amount that would trigger a mandatory five year sentence. So um, you, for hundred for each ounce, it was you know hundred times as much cocaine that you would need to uh, trigger that sentence as if as for uh, if you were found in possession of crack. So there was this serious racial disparity as a result because African Americans are disproportionately arrested for crack relative to cocaine. So the Fair Sentencing Act in 2010 um, brought this disparity down to 18 to one. wasn't able to completely eliminate it, but reduced it significantly. Recently, California did the same thing and equalized the weight levels for many types of drug, for many types of crack offenses, um, so that in order to eliminate this racial disparity, um, in many states around the country, they've been scaling back on mandatory drug sentences. So this is all really great, and this is all the kinds of reforms that uh, many people that have been working in this field for a long time waited a long time and worked really hard to create but it still doesn't go nearly far enough to address the scale of the problem that we've created in terms of public policy on, on drugs. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I was going to ask you, do you, do you think these, these small changes in, in a positive direction are, are um, the politicians or the um, legislature being cautiously optimistic and see how, you know, give them a little and see how it works? Or do you think they're trying to appease us by and large by just kind of throwing us a bone? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's, oh, sorry, I, I'm, I missed the last part of what you said. Do you think they're, they're really trying to just um, serve, serve us as a nation? Um, but being cautiously optimistic about it? Or do you think they're just trying to appease us and just throwing us a bone? Um, well, I think that there is a lot of, uh, you know, cautiousness to, uh, in, when it comes to sentencing reform because a lot of policymakers have the impression that the American public supports punishment, wants to lock people up, and it's a difficult issue for them to take lead a leadership role on. And so the more they hear from people um, uh, in terms of demand for making these kinds of reforms, the more uh, support that they receive once they uh, back these kinds of reforms, uh, the quicker we can get to where we need to get. Um, so in a couple of states, we've seen dramatic, uh, dramatic reductions in the prison population, and California is actually one of them, um, and it was largely the result of um, a Supreme Court decision, but some of the reforms actually started to take place a little bit before that as well. Um, and states like New York and New Jersey, uh, the legislature significantly scaled back um, sentences. In New York, it was especially for drug offenses, so uh, revising the, the notorious Rockefeller drug laws. So in some places, we're seeing significant shift, but policymakers really need to hear from people and really need to be educated that there is significant support for revising these kinds of policies. Now, I think the best way to uh, have people involved in this change is by voting, which is coming up November 5th. I'm very excited. I always feel so 100% American when I vote, and I get that sticker with the yep. American flag that says I voted. I really I wear it for at least two days until it's not sticky anymore. So mm. I think... <laughs> but uh, a lot of people don't realize 
that they have this kind of power. Um, besides a couple of states getting a little shady with the ID cards required, now, you know, they're going a little backwards. But for for the most part, this is um, one of the most, um, if not if not the only level playing field we have as American citizens to to share our collective voice because mm -hmm. they have to listen they they do count these votes I mean they they do count for something that's right so you know one of something that's really important to realize is that one of the ways that the, that the, the we can get policymakers into office that support uh, criminal justice reform is not just by convincing people that disagree um, about whether or not we need reforms but to get out the vote um, by people who agree about this issue. So if you think that it's important to reform these policies, it's especially important that you turn out um, and, at the ballot box. And if you can, take some people with you, take some friends and family with you, make sure that they're going out to vote. So this is something that's especially important on a midterm election like we have coming up. Um, something else is that people can directly vote on a lot of these issues, especially, for example, in California, there are a lot of ballot initiatives. So coming up on next week, is it next week? Yeah. Can you believe right. it? I can't, I can't even believe it. Yeah. So coming up next week, um, Californians can vote on Proposition 47. So this is a, a major piece of uh, potential reform that you know could go in either way. It seems to have a lot of support, but people really need to make sure to show up and, and uh, to help to get it passed. And what it does is it takes a, a number of um, lower level offenses that currently are wobblers. So they can either be charged as a misdemeanor or as a felony. It's up to the prosecutors to decide how to make that, de make that charging decision. And they will reclassify, this, pro this proposition will reclassify these wobblers as misdemeanors so that people do not get sent to prison for these offenses. And these include a lot of lower level um, uh, petty offenses, so petty, petty theft and um, drug possession. So this is, you know, really important to try to make it so that people that are caught with, you know, a really important potential piece, uh, piece of legislation to reduce punishment for these kinds of crimes, reduce spending on prison to address these issues, and the legislation also does a lot to transfer expenses that we had, that California had been making um, away from punishment and towards things like education. Um, and so it's a really great piece of legislation, and I encourage everyone to look into it and, and to support it. Yeah, and also I'm I feel very um, very proud to say that my county, Sonoma County, we're uh, North North Bay. Um, we have drug court as an option, and that's always um, you know prevention is always the best. But I mean you know there's a whole spectrum we go through, and there's a lot of success uh, with with drug court because it it allows people to have a chance and to feel that they can. Um, regain some control and feel empowered in their lives and a lot of these people they're not just these abstract concepts these are you, a lot of them are um, trying you know trying to make it single mothers and then yeah I, I, I see I see this a lot here so then mm -hmm. the kids get taken away um, so drug court is also um, very supportive with uh, trying to keep the family together trying to help the parent be um, a better a better parent for their kids and, and get back out there and, and it's a real second chance for a lot of these people and a lot of these I mean a lot of these families it's it's just so across the board this this whole drug um, addiction I just don't I don't see how anyone could be uh, against this unless they're just not uh, really aware of of the dire consequences people are facing um, for very minor, in my opinion, very minor crimes. Um, these are not uh, rapists and murderers. These are people that have a problem and for for the majority the medical community um, based on the medical model they say this is a disease. I mean this is the only disease uh, that you can go to prison for. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's um you know, drug courts are an excellent way to divert people away from prison. 
um, and they've been really su successful in a lot of jurisdictions. We would, you know, they we would love to see more of them, um, you know, to be able to handle an even larger scale of people that are currently headed to prison, and also to increase access to them. So right now, a lot of drug courts will. Um, not admit people that have a criminal background uh, and so this ends up excluding a lot of people that would otherwise really benefit from from uh, being able to enter drug courts instead of the traditional um, criminal justice processing courts so um, and it we know also that it disproportionately because of this exclusion because of these ex exclusionary criteria they will disproportionately exclude people of color. So, you know, we know that um, people of color in this country and whites, they use drugs at similar rates. Uh, that people generally buy drugs from people of the same racial or ethnic background as them. And yet, there's a real mismatch in terms of who's in prison for these kinds of offenses and the, the proportion of the general population um, that are people of color. So it's about 30% of the American public is um, African American or Latino, but about 60% of the population in prison for drug offenses are African American and Latino. So when drug courts have this restrictive criteria where they don't admit people who have prior, prior records, it ends up excluding disproportionately people of color for really uh, unwarranted reasons. Unwarranted reasons meaning that it's because of the police focus on communities of color to enforce drug laws, because of racial disparities that, that accrue as someone goes through the justice system. So um, after arrest, people of color are more likely to be charged more harshly, to be sentenced to prison and to long for longer lengths of time. So these are some of the issues that that come up when we think about um, you know the in innovations that we've seen and the extent to which they're able to tackle these problems. So um, drug courts are wonderful; they've been able to achieve a lot. We would just love to you know see some of these these wrinkles ironed out so that they can be even more effective. Well, I think for those that are um, uh, directly affected, meaning people that are in prison for these what we both seem to consider minor offenses, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of pigeonholed because uh, they're some and other people, they have already, they already have records um, that are felony convictions. So do you see this um, being able to be uh, like re retroactive where they can um, have their uh, former or their, or their prior criminal history is reduced once these laws go into effect? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, this question of retroactivity is one that, unfortunately, a lot of reforms um, consider only as an afterthought. So, you know, in, for example, places like California and Washington now that have legalized uh, recreational marijuana use, um, it really so now at this point in our in our history, if you're if you're smoking marijuana in one state versus the other, it matters a lot in terms of what whether you get into trouble, right? So in Washington and Colorado, you can do it in such ways that you won't get into you won't end up having a criminal record. But if for the exact same practice a couple of years ago, you might have gotten uh, caught and convicted, and that record is staying with you forever. So there, you know. A lot of times, what we need to do is push policymakers to think not just about what to do going forward, but to think about uh, what would create justice for people that were sentenced and can, you know, convicted and sentenced under the earlier set of laws that we had in place. So there is some good news. For example, there's um, an effort to there's the ban the box um, uh, in movement around the country, and so this is an effort to eliminate the box on applications, job applications, that ask people for whether they had a criminal conviction. Um, and not just to completely ban it, to be fair to employers and to allow them to ask for this information, but to ask it later in the screening process, not right away. So mm -hmm. some people that have criminal records, they can describe how they've gone to apply for jobs and an HR person is watching them fill out a form or somebody who works at the organization is watching them and as soon as they check off the box that they have a criminal record, they're told that they can just stop the application there because it's not going to go anywhere. 
So this is really problematic. It disproportionately affects people of color because of the disparities in drug law enforcement that I mentioned. And so a lot of, uh, uh, I think it's 12 states now, about 60 cities across the country have passed legislation to prevent at least public sector employers and in some cases yeah. also private sector employers from asking this question up front to at least delay it until someone has had a chance to put it, you know, their, get their foot in the door um, and to be considered and then to be more closely screened and, and this has been shown to help people quite a lot so that employers have a chance to get to know a little bit about the person that's applying and not just to think about them as, oh, this person is a criminal um, and I'm not interested in having criminals in the workplace where really this person is a person that was convicted of a crime, a crime that many people commit um, but that it's not, that is not enforcedly, that is not fairly enforced around our country. Yeah, we, we have that and I, and I think that's, that's a wonderful step in the right direction. Um, but it is, it does only affect those that are um, looking for federal employment or, or government employment, something like that. We have that here. But that's, you're exactly right. There's, there's so many, um, even in the addiction uh, industry, which it's a business, even even the people in in this industry are um, are pushing away people with prior uh, criminal history, which I think is just you know like if we can't take our own in, how can we expect anyone else to? Yeah. So I've said I've said this uh, in, in not um, it's just the reality is you know you can take their money for treatment, but you wouldn't hire them. I think mm -hmm. there's there's something wrong there. So I, this is a this is a multifaceted uh, conversation, and it's uh, it's just great, you know, for for someone like you who's really making uh, making changes and and helping with awareness to to shed some light on um, how how all of us as just individual people can help push this along faster. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, the example that you gave suggests that it's not even just about voting, but if you're in the position to make a hiring decision, if you're in the position to, um, if you own property and you're renting out units to people, to think about, to think a little bit more critically about the, the kinds of prejudices that you might have against people that have criminal records. Um, and to, you know, really question, to question that and think about its impact. Yeah, and I just think, you know, it, everyone has a psyche and it, it's always damaged and a little bit broken and, um, when, when you're in your active addiction. But to, when, when you get a new lease on life uh, and then you're still completely blocked by all of these policy, uh, wh where's, where's the incentive to you know, help push you through this, this dark time and to, and to get it together? You know, if if you know well, a lot of people in, in in when you're in addiction, people aren't thinking. You know, when the policy changes or when I vote, I mean, when they're you know homeless or or robbing a house because they they need their fix, they're they're not in 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 this place. So, but for the people that do recover, and there are millions, um, I think we need to have a united front and collectively go to the voting polls because we are a huge population. I know Florida is always catering to the senior citizens and we are a population just like any other. So we do have a lot of power but I think we need, we just need to continue having these conversations so people can really understand that they're not as powerless as they think they are or only the rich have um, any any access. We all have access to those voting booths. So I thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to to talk to us about this and and just educate us and to let us know what's going on and how we can be a part of the solution. It was my pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. And congratulations again on your on your doctorate last year. I, I just think that's so cool. <laughs>
Thanks very much. Thank you. And you can, um, if you want more information, which I'm sure you will, you can check out uh, the website. It's called the, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's sentencingproject.org, and that will um, give you a lot of information, and um, it's, a, it's a good place to start if you're interested in, in helping change policy which you're helping change the world. So it's kind of like we all have the capacity to be little superheroes, and I like that. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much. You take care. Bye. You too.